Oh, what your drinking tastes like poop. Mm -hmm. Oh, apple poop. <laughs> <laughs> So what are you making? What is your drink of choice this evening? The drink of choice for Amber Ruffin this evening is a margarita. But not just a margarita, a spicy margarita. Now, why you go spicy on your margaritas? Thank you for asking, because I felt like it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm Amber Ruffin, and I'm here to talk about the Little Rock Nine. I can't reach you. I got you. Oh, one more Do nine. Do it again. We're gonna celebrate. One more All right. nine. Our story starts in Arkansas. Little Rock, to be specific, it's 1957. The Supreme Court has just ruled in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education that separate is not equal. So their local NAACP went out to the black community and found nine kids to go to Central High School, the premier high school in Little Rock, Arkansas. So these kids are like, we are the Little Rock Nine. We are thugging nine visions of black excellence. We will go to school and we'll change the world. It'll be great. So then the governor of Arkansas, Orville Fabus, finds out that these kids are planning to integrate. And this bitch, Orville Fartbus, <laughs> you can fart all you want on Fartbus. Anyway, Orville Fartbus was like, hey, if these kids integrate, um, the streets will run red with blood. Orville Fartbus is a bitch. <clears throat> um, <laughs> so then the kids show up to school on September 4th, 1957, the first day of school. The senior in the group of the Little Rock Nine is Ernest Green. And he is like, oh my gosh, there is an ass load of angry white people. This angry white mob was like, we don't like you. You need to go away. We are going to beat you up and hang you from a tree. <laughs> this is so funny. Meanwhile, on the other side of school, Elizabeth Eckford, the ninth of the Little Rock Nine, is like, oh fuck, I'm here all by myself. Oh my God, there's a huge mob of white people. This is terrifying. They're yelling and they have signs and they're shouting shit. And they are like, hey, you're white. I mean, I'm white <laughs> and you're black. So that means I don't like you. So she gathers herself and this girl is G'd up, fucking face stone cold and walking through these people who want to um, pick her up and break her in two, just walking through like a G. And she sees the Arkansas National Guard. They must be here to help me, she thinks. She quickens her pace and she goes, hey, these white people are trying to kill me, please save me. And they like block her entrance. They are letting other white students in. And she's like, what is the deal? You are the National fucking Guard. If anybody needs to be guarded, it's me here now. So she leaves school. She sits down at the bus stop and the white people are surrounding her and they're like, uh, we don't like you. You are poopy. She waits several minutes for the bus. The bus pulls up and she is like, thank God I can finally get out of here. This isn't the last I will see of you, but also fucking fuck. Can I just get a fucking education? So uh. that was the first attempt and they lost. So attempt number two, they regroup. They go at it again in a week. They all got together this time and they all entered school at the same place at the same time. The Little Rock Police Force escorts the children into school and they say, hey, look, let me catch you out on the street any other day and then who knows what, but today we'll take care of you. <laughs> they escort the children into school and they hold the line so that the crazy, angry white mob does not act a fool. But the angry mob, they break through the police line and goes into the school and they're like, we hate black people so much. We're coming in this school to snatch you out. So the cops are like, fuck. So they get away in the nick of time because these people are so angry that they like beat up cops and push them out of the way so they could get to these children. White people. <clears throat> so 
They go to their houses. These kids are now like, oh man, there's nothing we can do. I feel very discouraged. All these white people are extra crazy. They're very mad. Ernest Green turns to the group and he says, you know what, we need to continue through to school because all of these white people are going to think we are to be fucked with. We absolutely can't give up. So, ba ba da do That story of the crazy white people of Little Rock, Arkansas, finds its way to Eisenhower. And he is like, this shit is fucking embarrassing. These white people are fucking my shit up. How dare these people think that they can use mob mentality to overrule? <laughs> I mean, none of these words are words that have ever come out of my mouth. Fuck. So President Eisenhower says, I'm gonna send in one thousand troops from the 101st Airborne. Not a hundred of them, a hundred would have done it. Not 200, not 300, but 1,000 of these people. The Little Rock Nine arrive at school together and the 101st Airborne is there. And they say, hey look, we are going to take care of you today. We're gonna take care of you today. <laughs> We're gonna take... Oh, okay, so they were like, we're gonna take care of you today. They uh, escort the children into school. They are holding back the crazy white people. So the Little Rock Nine is like, this is the shit. We did it. We win everything. Hooray for us. So they go into school, but once they get into school, they realize, oh shit, now we have to deal with these children. These white children are like, aha, you finally made it into school. Now you, you belong to us. We're gonna beat you up every chance we get. She's like, why? And they're like, we don't know exactly why we hate you. We just know that it's something our parents have handed down to us. And so we're just acting in what we believe are their best interests. And Elizabeth is like, well, I don't know that that is their best interest. Maybe if you just get along with me. And they're like, no. <laughs> These children give the Little Rock Nine hell for a whole year. And these little babies are being the blackediest black black that ever blacked, and it is blackening up my soul. Okay, so Ernest Green graduated, and he was like, oh, thank God, these people almost killed me. So Ernest Green walks across the stage, grabs his diploma, looks out in the audience, and sees Dr. Martin Luther King. Ernest was like, oh my God. That is Dr. Martin Luther the King. He's like, these people almost kill me, but I did it. Isn't this crazy? And then Dr. Martin Luther King was like, well, there's nothing else you have to do because you've already gone through it. Good job. Look at my nails, they're so beautiful. Hi. Hi, you're so pretty. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, okay, then the 40 year anniversary was in 1997. Oprah Winfrey had them on her show. And Oprah Winfrey was like, hey, Little Rock Nine, guess who I have on the show? The children that tormented you. And the bullies were like, look, back in 1957, we were little punks, but now we're cool dudes who love you. And we're sorry because we were mean to you, and being mean to black people is not cool anymore, so we just wanted to absolve ourselves of that. Their apologies were not up to 2019 standards. Their apologies were frankly bullshit. <laughs> but the Little Rock Nine forgave them for all the terrible things they did. And uh, that is more than fucking I ever would have done. <laughs> So in 1999, President Bill Clinton gave each of the Little Rock Nine the Congressional Gold Medal because what they went through was fucking amazing. It's shocking that anyone went through it, much less children. Cannot point out enough that they were children. So the Little Rock Nine wins. Everyone else is a piece of shit. The end. Racism's fixed and everything's fine. Oh, cool. Happy 2019. <laughs> Isn't it cool? Happy 2019.
2019. <laughs> um, I don't know what I was saying, but I love margaritas and black people. <gasps> Hello. Today we're going to talk about Claudette Colvin. Guess what? In Montgomery, Alabama, in 1955, a young black woman became the first person who was arrested for not giving up her seat to a white lady on the bus. That young woman's name is Claudette Colvin. Claudette Colvin is a 15-year-old bespectacled teenager. Uh-oh, let me say it, bespectacled teenager. It's a hard word. Bespectacled, she takes the bus home from school. So her friends are like, all right, we're having a fun trip to home. Uh-oh, a white lady. A white lady gets on the bus. The white lady's like, hey, you guys have to move because I'm white. Claudette's friends leave, but Claudette stays and is like, you know what? I paid my fare the same as this white lady paid her fare. So Claudette's like, F you, I'm sitting. Have a seat. White lady's like, I will not have a seat. The bus driver's like, I'm gonna get the cops. So the cops are like, move. Claudette's like, I shall not be moved. And they drag her off the bus. The only thing she knows to do is to go, it's my constitutional right. And they're like, it's 1955, and we don't have to do so you. Claudette's like, 1955. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, Wait, what? I was just saying, so, like... So, the NAACP is flooded with letters saying Claudette Colvin is so brave, she's wonderful. And the person who reads these letters, the secretary of the NAACP, Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks goes to Claudette Colvin's house and is like, Claudette, you're the sh Claudette's like, I f no. I'm the one who got my ass dragged to jail. And that's how they really connect and become friends. So whenever she's at an NAACP meeting, she spends the night at Rosa Parks' house. And Rosa Parks is like, you know what? You're great. Claudia Colvin is like, you're great. They really connect. Time passes. And E.D. Nixon, the president of their local chapter of the NAACP, is like, we need to start a bus boycott. And this bus boycott will start a revolution. We should use Claudette Colvin's arrest as a reason to boycott the buses. People get behind her, but then they were like, oh, but not white people because she has darker skin. And we can't have a 15-year-old as the face of the anti-segregation movement, but we can have Rosa Parks as the face of this movement. So it's at that time that Rosa Parks sits down in the white section of the bus and gets taken off to jail. But she had to act like, oh, I was just tired. Aren't I not threatening white people? And then white people were like, oh, she's just tired. We're eating this up. OK. <laughs> I'm just like hyper aware that like, this very moment could be on national TV. I'm an ass right now. OK. It's at this time that the NAACP put a flyer in the hand of every black person in Montgomery, including Claudette Colvin. The flyer says, please don't ride the bus on Monday. We are boycotting the arrest of Rosa Parks. And then Claudette Colvin is like, I can't believe that I'm finding out through a flyer that Rosa Parks did exactly what I did. I feel very hurt. Claudette Colvin is like, ouch. And at that same time, she finds out she's pregnant. She's like, her high school finds out that she's pregnant, so she's kicked out of high school. She's like, you know what, this. I'm moving to Burning Man. Did I say Burning Man? I thought Burning Man while well, I said Birmingham. Burning, Burning Man? Now I can't say Burning Man. Uh-oh, okay, I'm in a tailspin. Where in the world was I? Well, um... <laughs> At this time, the bus boycott has been going on for far too long. Fred Gray, one of the only two black lawyers in Montgomery, Alabama, goes to Claudette Colvin's house and he's like, let's sue the city of Montgomery for the fact that segregation is unconstitutional. Will you testify? She's like, absolutely, let me have this baby. So bam, she has this baby and they put some people on the stand and Claudette is the star witness, she's like, your Honor, I this and I that, and I hate segregation. 
the judge is like, uh, segregation is unconstitutional. They win the case. Uh, so she was like, you're welcome, Montgomery, f***ing Alabama. I ended segregation. Peace, I'm moving to New York to become a nurse. She moves to New York. They <laughs> meet, okay. Earlier I felt okay. And then the, after that I felt drunk. But then now it's really drunk. Okay, 55 years later, a reporter finds her and is like, are you Claudette Colvin? Didn't you do the thing that everyone kind of thinks Rosa Parks did, but she didn't, you did? And she's like, yes, it was me, it was me. And the reporter was like, aren't you jealous of Rosa Parks and how everyone celebrates her? And Claudette Colvin said, I made my peace with that. I'm just satisfied that my children can sit wherever they want on the bus. The end. Wow, well, you just crushed that. Thank you. It's my job right now to tell stories. How are you, cup? Hey, everyone. My name is Amber Ruffin. And I'm going to talk to you today about the angel of the battlefield, Clara Burton. <laughs> OK, our story begins during the Civil War. It's got f***ing fatalities, f***ing people are, <gasps> I'm guessing so bad. OK. OK. So the Union Army's surgeon, Dr. James Dunn, was like, hey, dudes, this is some bullshit. We are low on antiseptic. We are low on bandages. We do not have the supplies to handle the amount of bloodshed. <laughs> OK. Meanwhile, a teacher, Clara Barton, is like, I will worry about the soldiers of the Union Army. Hello, government. We need more medical supplies. Can you help me help your f***ing soldiers? And the government is like, oh, no. <laughs> and she's like, you know what? Your bitch ass needs to come correct. They're like, we will not come come, come correct. <laughs> oh, no, I spelled it. I'm sorry, I'm yelling. Oh my gosh, I'm also sorry for being sorry, because who does that help? No one. Ah! OK, so she asked the Ladies Aid Society, send me medical supplies, and I will bring them to the front lines. Meanwhile, in Sharpsburg, Maryland, the Confederate General Robert E. Lee was like, it is September 17th. 1862. And that's when the Battle of Antietam began. The Battle of Antietam! Ba ba boo! <laughs> the Battle of Antietam was the bloodiest single day battle in American history. So James Dunn is like, we are grossly underprepared. And it's at that exact moment that it burst Clara Barton with a train of wagons filled with supplies. And she's like, watch out, everybody, because a union is coming. It's like a <laughs> You're welcome, everybody. I brought your ass everything you need. Dr. James Dunn is like, I need antiseptic. She's like, I got that shit. He's like, do you have bandages? She's like, yeah, bitch, I got bandages. He's like, what we need is normal shit, like socks and food. And she's like, you know what? Abracadabra, bitch. And he's like, oh my god, you are the angel of the battlefield. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. She's like, stop thanking me. I have work to do. She starts working on wounded soldiers with no experience whatsoever. And at that moment, a bullet pierces her sleeve. And she's like, do you see this shit, dude? And the guy is like, I don't see that shit because I'm dead. Because the bullet that pierced her sleeve killed the very guy she was saving. So she's like, this sucks, but I am going to move on to the next thing. And move on to the next thing she does. <laughs> and at the end of the day, 
uh, Dr. James Dunn is sitting by himself in a dark barn. Clara Barton is like, Dr. Dunn, what the f are you doing? He's like, I am depressed. Night has fallen. I can't see shit. Hundreds of soldiers will die. Clara Barton is like, bitch, don't you know? She grabs him by the hand. She takes him to another barn. And this barn is lit with lanterns. She's like, you think I brought your ass socks, but I didn't bring you lanterns to light your surgeries? What the f is wrong with you? And he's like, I love you so much. You are truly the angel of the battlefield. Clara Barton is like, you done call me that already. F come up with some new shit. <coughs> she doesn't burp, but I wish she did so that I could also burp. She's like, Amber, if you feel like burping, you can burp. And I'm like, I'm darker than you think. She's like, you're very drunk. And I'm like, I am. Okay, so that's the end of the war. And everyone is like, Clara Barton, you rule. And someone special wants to meet with you. President Abraham Lincoln! <laughs> <laughs> And President Lincoln is like, Clara Barton, you did such a good job at the Battle of Antietam. You need to be the head of the office, offices, the OSIF, the office. Lincoln is drunk, but what he means is, Clara Barton, you need to be the head of the office of missing soldiers. She's like, I will, I super will. And so she finds over 22,000 soldiers. President Lincoln is like, bitch is on fire. And then they kiss, just kidding, they never kissed. <laughs> um, and in 1878, Clara Barton started the American chapter of the Red Cross. Clara Barton is like, I am the founder of the American Red Cross. Plus, I'm the angel of the battlefield. I changed America itself. I win. And everyone is like, you do win. Then. <laughs> that was great. Thanks, Clara. You want some water? Real no, quick. water's okay. for pussies.